Brought to you by Capital One. Capital One wants to build a better bank, one that feels and acts nothing like a typical bank. It's why they're reimagining banking by offering accounts with no fees or minimums and one of the best savings rates in America. You can open a Capital One account from anywhere in five minutes. That's banking reimagined. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Capital One N.A. Time for an oil change? Head to Jiffy Lube. We've got you covered. We've also got you covered when it comes to oil changes, thanks to Pennzoil Synthetic Motor Oil, getting you back on the road in a Jiffy. Jiffy Lube, leave worry behind. One minute into the show, it's off the rails. Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN2, presented by Progressive Insurance. A phone guest joined us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you'd think, Mike Sr., as Mike Golick Jr. is here with us, Trey Wingo here as well, you'd think, Mike, that of all three of us, the millennial here would figure out how to work his machinery. And the answer to that is a hard no. Yeah, right right, right before we're getting ready to come on air, we hear baseball or, or football play going on, and we don't have no idea where it's coming from. We think it's bleeding in from one of the TVs, yeah. or people behind the glass had done something and wrong. And it's your oh, iPad. No. I don't know if you're watching tape, you got a game this week or what, and you have no idea it's your iPad, and then you have no idea how to shut it off. That was pretty amazing. I mean, it was seriously. just playing phantom noise. I don't know what, listen, I'm not perfect, all right? I don't claim to be, but like you said, I'm hard at work. Northern Illinois and Utah play this week, and someone's got to call the damn games. Is that someone might as well be me. Shameless plug, by the way, ESPN News on Saturday. Check that out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, listen, I had a lot going on, and it just, I got to work off this iPad. I don't know what you want from me. Uh, I, I, you know what? I want for you to control the volume of your freaking iPad. That's yeah. what I want. Gratuitous self promotion. <laughs> is that little is late, that, Cliff? But not little bad. late, Cliff. Little, little, little late, late, Cliff. Have that but, ready. It's going to be the, there all week. But the good news is because Cliff was a little late, we can say the pettiest show in America. There you go. And we are off and running on a Tuesday morning. Hope everybody's holiday weekend was good. I know you guys were up at Notre Dame for the, for the weekend. It was, and yesterday was, uh, was still kind of a rough day for us recovering yeah. from. <laughs> it was really sweaty. Oh, the win. Yeah, that's right. The win. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. The, uh, the listen, win. Uh, yeah. the hydration was probably a big part of your day yesterday. So we are just two days, guys, two days away from the start of. Oh. oh. The NFL season. You yeah. geared up? You feeling good about it? You feeling ready oh, to roll? Oh, listen, we were feeling great coming off the week one of college football. Yep. Uh, great week of college football ended last night, which wasn't great for Florida State, as obviously we'll get into. But uh, And now we go right into this week where we actually had some quarterbacks being named starters yesterday and finally got it squared away in Philadelphia and answered that. We basically all knew anyway. Yeah, a lot of really obvious quarterback statements being made, but you're right. That was all I could think about this weekend was – all right, Saturday was great because we got to sit around and watch college football all day, and now this weekend we will have that on Saturday, and we will have a full slate of games on Sunday in the NFL. Well, it's it's. I did dig the fact that the we had a, year we dream of. We had a college game uh, on Sunday night, a college game on Monday night, so that just you know cut it's a down good weekend, cut down the time to the next game on yes. Thursday. So it's worked out pretty well, and we threw a holiday in there as well. And yesterday, Mike and myself and Jason Fitz, we got a. Comp day. There you go. I took the comp day. Yeah. By the way, the best part is, Gola came into me and said, "Hey, did you play golf?" And I looked at him like, "Did you have a donut?" Yeah, I mean, the answer true. to that question is a, always going to be the same. A pretty dumb an- uh, question. The answer to the, both yeah. of those questions is always yes. And the booth is screaming at us, "Can we get to what's trending?" And I'll the answer take to that time in there is always yes. And we have run out of time for Roger Federer at the U.S. Open. Lost to journeyman John Millman uh, in the fourth round, who is ranked number 55 in the ATP rankings. Just so people understand, this is the first time that John Millman, the Australian, has ever beaten a top 10 player, and it's the first time ever that Federer has lost to someone outside the top 50 at the U.S. Open. You know, we talked about the heat. They changed the rule. The heat breaks for the men in this one made it like they do with the women between the second and third set, between the third and the fourth set where they got that extra 10-minute break. We've seen Djokovic have a couple of medical issues twice already during this tournament. And while last night when Federer was playing, it was only in the 80s, but the humidity was 75%, he flat out said he couldn't get any air. He said it, there was no circulation. He said it was one of the few times that, uh, that, that he couldn't really get going. And for Millman, he said the turning point, without a doubt, Federer took the first set that, uh, he, Federer was then serving at three set points in the second set. Would have been up two sets to love. Would have been difficult, I think, for Millman to come back. And Millman ended up winning that set. And Millman even said that to me was the turning point, even at 1-1, even in that third set. 
Federer had a chance to win it as well and did it. So had his chances, 10 double faults, 78 unforced errors, and he said just sloppy play for him in that heat. Well, and that's what you look for, though, if you're someone who's trying to get in that underdog role. I mean, remember years ago when USC was at the height of their power and they came to Notre Dame and Notre Dame grew the grass out. They said, yeah. we want to bring them down to our speed. And so, I mean, we were we were both mutters. Yeah. The, oh, the yeah. bush push game. Yeah, uh, the bush push game. I and mean, we were both mutters. We liked everyone coming down to us. And so for Roger Federer, this all-time great, if you can have the heat weaken him a little bit it opens you up to something like this. and the interesting thing is uh Federer has always uh really respected Millman's intensity right. he asked him to train with him in Switzerland in, in the off season but th- the heat really did affect Federer at 37 much more than Millman Millman is from Brisbane Australia for those people that don't know that might be the hottest muggiest place on the planet so the conditions were actually perfect for him and as you alluded to Mike they were not great for Fed I just thought it was very hot tonight and um it was just one of those nights where I guess I felt I couldn't get air. You know, there was no circulation at all. And um, I don't know, for some reason, I just struggled in the conditions tonight. You know, um, it's one of the first times it happened to me. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's uncomfortable. And clearly, just keep on sweating more and more and more as the match goes on. And, you know, you lose energy as, as it goes by. But, uh, you know, John was able to deal with it better. He maybe comes from one of the most humid places on earth from Brisbane. So I knew I was in for a tough one. And, uh, you know, maybe when you feel like that as well, you, um, start missing chances, obviously. And I had those. So that was disappointing. But, uh, look, I'm just, uh, at some point also, I was happy that the match was over, I guess. So Milman now has to make the switch from Federer to Djokovic. Good nice. luck with that. Yeah. Making the switch is brought to you by Pennzoil Synthetics, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. And then Millman was asked about that after the match and had a very interesting answer after answering the first question. Last time I played him, I got three games at Queens. Um, so let's hope a few more. No, but look, I'm, I'm playing some good tennis right now. Novak's an incredible player. Um, just playing such good tennis right now. I think off, off Wimbledon, winning Cincinnati also. Uh, he moves incredibly well. Uh, you know, he's another guy that I've looked up to with his game style and, and the way he goes about it. So, look, I, it's one o'clock now. I probably should try to get a recovery. I've got a seven o'clock in the morning fantasy draft, so I'm going to get up for that and hopefully have a good draft. I'm, sec- that- I'm second pick. I don't know whether to go Gurley or Le'Veon Bell. Oh, I, I think if he's available, you got to go Gurley, don't well, you? Because yeah, okay, Bell is Bell still not available. Reported. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I, mean, I think Bell, when he comes in, will come in and play well, but he may not have a choice because one of those guys may go w- w- go first. Yeah, exactly. But I think I'd go Gurley over Bell at this point Seconds just for the fact easier. that Gurley's in. Yes, yeah, that, that would yeah. make that would make the decision a little easier on both yeah. counts. So picking second and with that information, you're armed with knowledge. You should be in a good situation. Yeah. And by the way, when people ask, why do you talk about football so much? Because... People like John Millman are waking up at 7 o'clock after beating Roger Federer to do their fantasy draft. We continue what's trending, and for the second straight week in the richest part of the PGA Tour season, the FedEx playoffs, Bryson DeChambeau took down one of the strongest fields of the year by playing his best golf to win the Dell Technologies Championship, becoming the second player to capture the opening two playoff events in the FedEx Cup. And he, once again, sparkling round Saturday and sort of was uh, pulling away on Sunday, just like he did at the Northern Trust. Games. Yeah, I mean, pretty impressive what he's doing. And we have the three of the four captains picks today mm-hmm. by Jim Furyk for Jimmy, the Ryder Cup team. Jimbo. Listen, DeChambeau is going to be one of the easiest yes, picks out is. there, isn't he? He's not one of the eight automatic qualifiers, but I, I, I don't think that's going to be a difficult pick at all. We all think Tiger, who had a decent showing in this, decent, didn't play all that great yesterday. Stumbled down the what, back. Yeah, yeah, the last, what, three holes or four holes, double, uh, um, bogey, double, was bogey, three over. Really took him out. Uh, so, and, and Phil played well yesterday. Phil's played pretty well Shot the last couple, three or couple of weeks. So you're looking at, you were, we're still looking for that fourth. We think it's Tony Finau. We're behind Tony Finau, but going to be DeChambeau. We think Mickelson and Tiger Woods. Do you think? Those are the three named today. Yeah, I so think there's that, four that have to be yeah. named, but only three are named today. Three will be named today, five o'clock uh, Eastern on the Golf Channel. And let's just say I would be shocked 
if the three names are not in any order, Bryson DeChambeau, Phil Mickelson, and Tiger Woods. DeChambeau Those are the three. Well, mine. and we always hear that a part of this is how guy, these guys are trending. And yeah. for DeChambeau, he's got what? He's got picked up his fourth career PGA Tour victory, but three have come since June. Yeah. Like this guy has been hot lately at the right time. So it would make all the sense in the world to ride that wave into the Ryder Cup, hopefully, because a- some a- of it's been uncharacteristic of his normal game. Yeah. Listen, this is a guy who's still only 24 years old and is just a weird dude. Remember there was a Story. Not weird, but interesting, quirky. Uh, he was the one that, remember, the protractor, the compass, oh, yeah. to yeah. read the greens. They call him the mad scientist, and this was his press conference uh, after the win. Do you recall the first science project you ever did? <laughs> yeah, it was it had been tr- one like in elementary school, right? Uh, it, it, funny enough, I was actually trying to come up with a theory that was, uh, <laughs> should I even say this? Um, all right, yeah. <laughs> so my first science project, I had a theory about gravity, that gravity actually pushed outward and not inward. And, I, <laughs> yeah, that's going to throw you guys for a loop. Um, it actually got uh, pretty high up there in the science fair. It was, it was pretty well explained, and I had a couple interesting theories about it. Um, and I described it very, very well, and, and that was like in sixth, seventh grade, I think it was. But it, it was pretty much gravity that was just – pushing in the opposite direction. Wow. Sure. I'm okay. sure you guys thought about that a lot, So right? sixth grade, he's talking about outward or inward and gravity. And that time, I was just like an Audi or Nini for my belly button. I mean, that was kind of where I was. <laughs> At sixth grade, I was pulling a I was pulling a donut out of a tire tread and yeah. eating it after it had gone about right. a mile. That's right. Tread, I remember so. when you did that. Yeah. yeah. So me and Bryson DeChambeau had largely different childhoods, although I will say now I know the YouTube rabbit hole I'm going down when I get yeah, home. We, Outward I was about gravity. To say, I'm already in. looking it up right now, and I, I'm trying to make no sense of it. I mean, I think I was eating lead paint chips uh, at, at that time when I was in the sixth or seventh grade. I'm not sure grade. I knew of gravity Stay in sixth grade. Yeah. I, I just the, look, the guy's incredibly quirky. Again, if you don't know, all his irons are the same length because he has this theory yeah, about yeah. one one repetitive swing is easier and all that kind of stuff. He's an interesting dude, and by the way, his name is being announced today. Yes, uh, it five is. Five o'clock on the Golf Channel is being one of the three uh, captains' picks, and the one, the final pick, which we think will be Tony Finau, will be coming next week. Who also played pretty well over the weekend. Well, uh, you, they just played the "You Stay Wingo" drop. You stay Degrom, wow. because Jacob Degrom did the most Jacob Degrom thing ever. He allowed one run on two hits in six innings on Labor Day. Also had two hits. It was his 25th straight start, allowing three runs or fewer, tying the longest single streak by any pitcher in Major League history. And, of course, he didn't get the win. It, I mean, it's just incredible. After allowing a solo home run, uh, he extended his streak of quality starts to 20 games, breaking a tie with Tom Seaver in 1973 for the Mets' single-season record. So, again, he's battling with Aaron Nola from the Phillies and Scherzer from Washington. You, you look at their stats for ERA, whip strikeouts per nine, and wins, and basically they're all in the top ten in all those categories except for wins. DeGrom is 26. <laughs> I mean, it's Scherzer who's basically just about first in just about every one of those categories, so a race to the end. But for DeGrom, again, the record is Fernando Valenzuela back in 91, I believe it was, and a few years ago, Felix Hernandez for with uh, 13 wins to win a Cy Young. He could do it with eight. He could do it with that because I don't know if he's getting any more wins. Because that's, sure that's the amazing yes. thing. I mean, he may finish at eight the way it, this is going. He really might. It's unbelievable. What a just tremendously frustrating. We talk all the time about how siloed baseball is and about it's, you know, batters versus pitchers and all this stuff where you can kind of cancel it out. You know, I, I think of for love of the game where it's clear the mechanism where it really is just you and that pitch and that batter. But man, some of this has to wear on your performance a little bit. Just this continued bit, bout of go out there, give your best effort. And for the team, because these guys are still team players at the heart of this, it to not be good enough to help get them over the hump and to not get that support has to be maddening. Let's just try and explain it this way. How good of a season Jacob deGrom is having. In 2014, Clayton Kershaw won the Cy Young and was MVP of the league as a pitcher. He had 27 starts. Jacob DeGrom this season already has 28 starts. Clayton Kershaw's Cy Young MVP season, he had an ERA of 1.77. Jacob DeGrom this season, an ERA of 1.68. Clayton Kershaw that season averaged just under 11 strikeouts per nine innings. Jacob DeGrom is averaging over 11 strikeouts per nine innings. That year, Clayton Clayton Kershaw's record was 21-3. and With all those better stats, 
Jacob DeGrom is 8-8. Eight and eight. Yeah, it's that's, amazing. Yeah. That's how Crazy. good he's been, and that's why wins and losses should not determine who the best pitcher is in Major League Baseball. Absolutely stunning the season DeGrom is having, and of course, the Mets got the win, but he didn't. And we got a pair of winner-take-all games in the WNBA semifinals tonight on ESPN2. First at 8, the number 1 seed Atlanta Dream play host to Elena Deladon and the Washington Mystics. The Mystics have never reached the WNBA Finals. And then at 10 on ESPN News, Diana Taurasi and the Phoenix Mercury will play in Seattle against the Storm. So you, you look at Atlanta and Washington. Remember, Elena Deladon hurt her knee and he thought, uh-oh, but it turned out to be a bone bruise. So uh, luckily for her and that team, it wasn't anything that was going to knock her out completely of the playoffs. She had been, I think, in the, in the uh, WNBA Finals back in 2014 when she was in Chicago. And then you look at the other side, and it's about two uh, former UConn players. Uh, Diana Taurasi is, what, 13-0 and in winner-take-all games, and Sue Bird for Seattle is playing with her fifth broken nose as a professional. <laughs> fifth one. Love I mean, that. And that's that's getting your face in the, in the mix, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, not a, not a Or in the way, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, I'd say not a, either, either way, your face probably not appreciative of all that, no. but uh, they're certainly appreciative of the effort. Diana Taurasi, you mentioned 13-0 and in winner-take-all yeah. games in the M- uh, WNBA. 50 and 7 in elimination games, including the NBA, Olympics, and NCAA competition back at UConn. It's incredible. Yeah. Like, just a staggering yeah. resume of winning. It makes no, it makes sense. We always talk when we get to like the Super Bowl and the quarterfinals of players from different alma maters that might have a chance to win. UConn has to walk into this every year feeling pretty comfortable that some former UConn star is going to be hoisting the trophy. Yes, and UConn used to be very comfortable in the Final Four until Notre Dame showed up this yeah, guy's buddy. year. Took him down a peg Whoops. the one year you didn't make a yeah. bet with Rebecca so Lobo. Incredibly the one year you didn't do that. So again, <sighs> we'll see what happens tonight in a pair of WNBA semifinal games. All right, Golgan Wingo presented by Progressive Insurance. Commercial insurance through Progressive protects your business and your dream. Choose from over 30 coverage options at ProgressiveCommercial.com. Okay, so we had Monday Night Football last night. Just not the Monday Night Football we're normally accustomed to. In uh, the month of September, it was a college game. And, of course, uh, a week from yesterday, we'll have the first doubleheader of the Monday Night Football season in the NFL. And those two games are shaping up to be very interesting, especially uh, the latter one where you have the team that paid their player, the Rams, against the team yeah. that jettisoned their player, the Raiders. And we'll get into a little bit of that going forward. Uh, but we did have a Monday Night Football game last night, and Virginia Tech absolutely stomped on Florida State in Tallahassee, winning 24-3. to It was a huge, huge start for the season for Virginia Tech. Here was Justin Fuente, their head coach, after the game. All right, Coach, you said you wanted to see how this team, young as it is, was able to finish this game. What did you see from them throughout the second half? Well, we battled. Obviously, there in the third quarter, we kept them pinned down. And and I was worried that we, we let a couple too many opportunities get away. But uh, we found a way to get it done. I'm proud of our kids. You knew you were going to learn something about your team on both sides of the ball. Uh, what did they show you in their road game? On- well, the stage wasn't too big for them, which I'm proud of. I mean, they prepared. They understood that it's about playing the next play. Now, our challenge is in five days we got to play again. So I'm happy for them tonight. And then tomorrow we got to get back to work. Uh, what was your takeaway from what you saw? Well, last I mean, night? The, my takeaway was Florida State. Uh, you know, a lot of buildup with uh, Francois coming back after the opening game last year against Alabama, when he heard they they were tied three three in that game, ended up getting beat twenty four to seven. Or, or yeah, they ended up getting beat twenty four to seven in that game. I should say uh, it was close early, but but Francois ends up hurting his knee, missed the entire season. This is his first game back. His percentages, I mean, if you want to look, you know, by the, by the number, were pretty nice. I believe he completed about sixty six percent of his passes. But boy, it, it didn't. They they look like a team when we keep talking about college and preseason and no preseason games. They looked it looked sloppy for them. Uh, and Virginia Tech looked very good, and they, they play that brand of Beamer ball, getting that block punt for a touchdown, which is something that you're so used to seeing covering a Virginia Tech team. But a big win for them and a tough loss for Florida State. Again, last year they were minus three in the turnovers against Alabama. Last night, minus five. You're not winning games when you do that. Turn the ball over five times. No, and to me, last night drove home two things. One, Clemson could have the easiest road to the college football Yeah, I playoff. heard you saying yeah. that this yeah. morning. So true. In the country, 
And Florida State last night represented every negative stereotype about the college game. Poor offensive line play out of that group, undisciplined, sloppy, turnover-ridden football. Yep. The reason you run these hurry-up, up-tempo offenses Clock is to simplify things. And game. when you have a lot of these guys in situations where there was tons of pre-snap penalties, there were tons of holdings, <laughs> all these things. I mean, we had the stat, over 55% of their plays went for zero or negative yards. That, Chuck- that was unbelievable. That was an unbelievable stat. Make sure we, we get that one right. I, I read, I'm trying to, uh, to find that. It was amazing. Uh, cause I, I heard you talk about it this morning. Uh, and I think it was 35 of their plays or something like they that. They ran 63 for... plays, and I think 35 went for zero or negative yards. It's is unreal. that bad? That and, is unreal. I mean, let's put, uh, Chuck Martin, who I believe is the coach of Miami of Ohio, was my offensive coordinator my senior year and said, if we can just get back to the line of scrimmage and just fall forward on every play, if we can stay that, you at least put yourself in a position Correct. to get to third down and be successful. <laughs> the amount of third and longs that DeAndre Francois had to try and overcome, especially in the first half of that game, where he was still accurate up till that point, was was staggering and completely indicative of what an absolute abomination that offense was. I I think what kind of encapsulated it for Florida State, when they got down to the goal line in the second quarter, it was a play where their their ball carrier got into the end zone. It looked like his knee was down before, but when you watched it, he was actually on the defender. He was in for a touchdown. That would have gone to replay. Florida State rushed to the line of scrimmage, rushed a couple of extra offensive linemen out of the field to get a jumbo package, tried to get the playoff quickly. If they'd have waited, it would have gone to review. They tried to hustle the play. They get movement, and they lose five yards. Yep. They get a penalty against them and end up only getting a field goal out of it. I mean, that that to me was like, wow, that was kind of it for them. It reminded me of the play of our colleague now, John Fox, last year in Chicago when he challenged whether or not the guy had scored. And it would have been a first and goal, and then went to review and said, "No, he actually fumbled over the goal line. Yeah. It was a touchback." You lose the ball. Sometimes yeah. you just let these things play, let them breathe a little bit, and sometimes they'll work out a little bit better. Speaking of letting things breathe, I, I, I think I buried the lead. Has anybody heard from Adnan this morning? Is uh, he okay? I, Do we know that Adnan Verk is all right after Federer went down to John Milman? I mean, I think yeah, I know there, he was in Tallahassee lead. last night. Oh so yeah, he was. Yeah. He was there down. If anyone has heard or seen Ann Edberg, please let us know because that's going to be very important. Yeah. Tough day for him today. It, it is. A, it is a very, very tough day. All right, coming up. Do you guys know the last time that Florida State, Miami, both started the season zero and one? Sure do. We'll get into that. Plus, we have a couple of head coaches doing the one things they did not want to do: name a starting quarterback. It's been a long off-season without football, but FanDuel has spent it getting into the best shape of their lives. That means this, FanDuel is ready for more. More ways to play, more ways to challenge your friends, and most importantly, more ways to win. FanDuel also has new options for playing daily fantasy with your friends because the only thing better than winning cash is winning your friends' cash. Right now, you can get a $20 bonus when you make your first deposit on FanDuel. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Will Kane. Age and state restrictions apply. It's time, time to join the millions of people that meet happy with Zoom video conferencing. Zoom gives you flawless video, crystal clear audio, and instant sharing across any mobile, tablet, or desktop device. But the best thing about Zoom? It just works. So ditch the distractions, join the movement, and meet happy with Zoom video conferencing. Visit zoom.us to set up your free account today. That's zoom.us. Zoom video conferencing. Technology powers your business and technology changes, but chances are you're still using video conferencing that was wow 10 years ago, but feels more like whoa today. Ditch the choppy video and crappy audio and get back to wow with Zoom. It's the easiest, most reliable video collaboration suite, and it costs about a third of what you're probably paying now. Wow, not whoa. Visit zoom.us to set up a free account today. That's zoom.us. Zoom video conferencing. Yeah, technically we got a few more weeks, but let's be honest, it's over. Summer's over. I'm wondering It's if over. It, Summer's over. Can Done. I ask really quickly? Yeah. Done. Cliff, is there a secondary reason that you played this song? There's no reason at all. I'm a big Luke Bryan fan. Do you know the whole thing that was going on last week on this show, what we were trying to get me to do at college game day? Yes, yes, yes. To yes. do be the celebrity picker. Yes. Do you oh, know you who the Do you know who the celebrity picker it was, was? It was Luke Bryan. I was, yeah. I was yeah. locked in. So uh, I, I I think that was a little slap at me. That's fine. Listen, listen. That, oh, that's fine, Cliff. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> you feel? Rub it in a little bit. I meant to hurt your feelings. Yeah. Okay. Luke did a great job. L- by l- the way. Let me good, let me just say this real quick. Yeah. 
Diva. Yeah. Right, glad you're with us. Golden and Wingo, ESPN Radio and ESPN2, presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Penzoil performance line. By the way, do you guys know, you guys know the last time uh, that both Florida State and Miami started the season 0-1? I'm going to say it was a long time ago. That, uh, that I'm is probably correct. going to go... Wasn't in my, it had to be before me, so it had to be in the 70s. 80s, 70s. going to pick a year or just take a decade? Well, no, I don't think you can just take a decade. I'll take the 200s. Am I right in the decade? I'm though? not telling you. Uh, you 2000, had, 2004. I don't know. I'll say 19. I think it's a 70, so since I don't know it, I'll just split it in half and go 75. Bang! We have a winner. Mike Golick, 1975. Was it really? Wow. Yes, 100%. Oh, wow. 1975. I knew it all along. Sure you did. Ah. <laughs> Maybe that's why you should have been the picker. So you I, could, actually, you the right I actually heard him tell you. I know. I know. Very <laughs> Nicely done. Way to play I it, I thought though. I played it pretty well. You well. played that very well. Luke Bryan would have played it better, I'm sure. <laughs> well, apparently he did. Ah, because he, he was did. picking and not you. <laughs> okay, glad you're with us. Again, it's time for Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. And we have some straight talk with a lot of people doing things they don't want to do which is essentially naming a starting quarterback for their football team. Who knew this was so hard? Uh, after what we saw in uh, the game at Louisville with Alabama, Tua started, Jalen Hurts played, and then, of course, the post-game press conference uh, on the field, which I think we all remember, uh, Nick Saban came out and said this. Everybody knows that you know, Tua is going to start you know, this game. And we're going to use Jalen's skill set in the future to help however we we feel that he can benefit the team. And I just want to be clear with everyone that I have done this in the past where we don't say who the starter is going to be for the first game. And we give both quarterbacks an opportunity to play in the game, which is exactly what we did in this game. Not a whole lot different than what we've done in the past. All right, so now we know. And you know. And that is true. He has done this in the past, but it sounded like he would rather say anything than what he just said. Listen, to me, okay, he's done it in the past, but this one had a little different feel to it because of of Jalen speaking out, talking about how no coaches or anybody said anything to him. He felt a little disrespected about going, going into spring ball when nobody said anything about what was going on at the quarterback position. All of a sudden, it seemed there was an awful lot of Love for Jalen Hurts. I don't think that I, that I, I think that's what Nick Saban wanted to show. So while he has done this before, I, I, I understand that this seemed a little bit more on the protective side. You put that with the emotion, as I heard him say, he didn't, he wasn't happy that at the end of the game, the way they, play, even in a blowout, uh, Nick Saban is a guy that still gets mad when he sees little mistakes, and I get it. That's how you know great coaches are are like that. A lot of coaches are like that, quite honestly. So he was a little upset. I think he was going to give that narrative anyway about the quarterbacks. Maria happened to, didn't even ask him about how they played, just ask a pretty, pretty basic question. But I think he didn't care what the question was. He was going to get his answer out. You couple that with the, fr- a little bit of frustration at the end of the game and it being right after the game when we want to get them in the moment. And we got him as we talked about yesterday. He was, had a message to send to his players and to Jalen Hurts, but he went a little over the line at that time. Well, it's just hilarious how now he t- responds today in the way he could have after the game, yeah. which is also the hilarious message. Talked about how he loves all his players, you know, about how, like, there is, what do you say, like, there is kids. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and here is again Nick going into more about what happened between him and Maria Taylor after the game. Do you have any regrets about the post game interview with Maria Taylor on ESPN? You know, I talked to Marie, and I could have handled it in a better way. But I do think that the statement that I made before about loving our players, and if I get asked to vilify a player and make another one a crown prince publicly, I might not respond to that, and I need to learn a better way to respond to that. And I will in the future. And I pray every Sunday that I never get angry. But it was a time and circumstance thing for me. I was a little upset by the way we finished the game, the penalties that we had, the mental errors that we had. So it, it was totally my responsibility, and um, we, we, we apologized for it. All right, look, we're moving on from this because whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, well, exactly. let me just, I just want to say one thing about this. When he says, I'll never respond to someone trying to vilify our players, that was not – in any way, shape, or form what the question was. She said, what did you learn about your two quarterbacks? She didn't say, tell me something bad about your two quarterbacks. 
There's no soapbox here, but let's just be honest about what it was. He chose to go down that road because, as you said, he wanted to get that answer and, out there. That that question was completely normal and fine. And quickly what I'll say, because I've heard people say he should have just answered this way. Well, Nick Saban has been doing this a long time. Correct. When is Nick Saban has, has ruffled more than a few feathers in the media. So to to all of a sudden say he should have done it this way, that's a little tough to say. I mean, Nick has a little bit of a fuse to him. Nick is not afraid to, to go off a little bit. So he's more apt to step over the line than he is to give the answer that everybody thinks we should hear from a coach, in my opinion. I mean, but if what everyone wants to hear, it's what he purports to want to say. Like, if you tell us you want to talk glowingly about your players, then do it. You chose to make it a combative thing. That's my. I guess my thing too is if you want to say that's Nick, then don't get mad when we say he acted like a jerk. Like if you're saying he chooses to act like a jerk, then all the people who get mad when we call it what it is need to probably pipe down on well, that. No, I agree with that like, because and listen, he is harsh. He is so. So was Belichick. So was Parcells. So was Popovich. You know, we've all kind of we may not like it at, at times the way the way they sometimes treat people, but that's the way they are. So you know, for for anybody that says they should do this or they should do that, well, they're not going to. They they're not are doing, who they are. They're not well, doing it for you. I know, but I, I'm not asking anyone to do anything for anyone. But when Nick Saban says what he said in the press conference the next day, I love all my players. They're like my kids. Some kids do certain things better than others, like throw a football in this case. Like you said all that there, you could have just said it. But after. he always <laughs> does that in response to going. Or pushing the line. That's Nick Saban. Yeah, He's yes. not going to say that the first time around. I mean, and and I don't think we should expect it at this point. He doesn't do that much, so I, I don't know why all of a sudden we should expect this nice, calm Nick Saban when you don't get that a whole lot. I mean, it's it, it's kind of who he is. Yeah, and you know what? It's been really successful, and it's that's worked. never going to change, much in the same way you can try and change the way Bill Belichick is doing and he'll just say we're on to Cincinnati. I mean, that's the way we it's going to go. We do need to kind of parse that, though, because not every one of those traits is tied back yeah. to this core value that makes them <clears throat> successful. Sometimes that's a trait that might you know not work in that. Him being like that doesn't make him a great coach. And by the way, we're now <laughs> on to the break. And that was Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Words. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. <laughs> Words. Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. Coming up, more starting quarterbacks have been named, and an RB still isn't there, and this team really needs that RB to be there. We'll get to that. And I think, Darnold, you're ready to start him. Put him on the field, man. Let's get this thing going. We're not starting him because he's a rookie and he's not ready. We're starting him because he gives us a chance to win the game. You have the biggest lotto ticket the NFL can offer. You got to get it on the field. You got to see if it's real or if it's fool's gold. The game doesn't seem too big for him. He's playing beyond his years right now. He just came in with a work hard mentality and kept his head down and he earned it. Sports Center brought to you by Goodyear and college football. Getting knocked down makes you tougher, but getting back up makes you blimp worthy. Keep going strong no matter what on tires you can count on. Let Goodyear help you choose the right tires at Goodyear.com. Gold and Wingo with you on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. You can get in touch with us two ways. 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed at Golik and Wingo or call in on our call in line 860-506-5505. Let us know what you're thinking about, and we'll decide whether or not we want to talk about it. Uh, one of the things that we know for sure, and actually we've probably known for a while, is that we will have at least one rookie quarterback starting week one of the regular season in the NFL for 11 straight seasons. Uh, that was sealed for certain when Todd Bowles made the announcement we all knew was coming. Sam Darnold will start week one Monday night football for the Jets. Sam had a good preseason. We weren't holding him back, but we weren't rushing him at the same time. He'll still have some things to learn, but his poise in the pocket and the way he grasps the offense coming in right away and the guys uh, gather around him and absorb him coming in playing football, he gives us a very good chance to win. We're not starting him because he's a rookie and he's not ready. We're starting him because he gives us a chance to win the game. No well, surprise here, no. right? Oh, no, n not at all. Especially I, after they traded Bridgewater. You know, and, and I, I heard people talking about, you know, he's, he played the best. He, he did play well in the preseason and is the only rookie starter. He was really the only one, save for maybe Josh Allen, that had a chance, right? I mean, Tyrod Taylor was absolutely positively named the starter, brought into Cleveland. Sam Bradford was brought into Arizona at $20 million to be the starter. There was no clear-cut starter with the Jets. Josh McCown, they kept him around there. They wanted an older guy. 
uh, to to be in that quarterback room. They brought in Teddy Bridgewater, which we had no idea how he was going to play coming off that injury. And you get a a, a guy in Sam Darnold, who we all thought was going to be the number one pick, and then the season happened. Twenty two turnovers later, we had a little bit of trepidation, but he was in the, in my opinion, outside of of Josh Allen as well, the best position to start. Yeah, once he fell into their laps there, and that was how the Jets yeah. responded to this: is they felt like they struck absolute gold because of where he fell to them in the draft. They they positioned everything in a way to try and get him ready. And we know there was that bit of a contract dispute. There was the holdout. And then they talked about him showing up there and immediately hitting the ground running. So you can prepare for it in all those ways. This is still about Sam Darnold coming in, and it seems like really wowing a lot of people yeah. behind closed doors there. He absolutely has. Um, so that is the record that continues now with the Darnold starting week one. A lot of people thought Josh Allen might start for the Buffalo Bills uh, week one. Instead, they are going with Nathan Peterman. And this was Josh Allen asked about if he's upset or disappointed with him not starting week one. Does this feel like a step back in your development at all? No, not at all. You know, I think that, you know, if you look around the league, rookie quarterbacks that start, you know, it might not be week one. It might not be their first year. I think as long as you're able to take the mental reps that you're looking at in practice, um, you're doing the right things, developing a routine that a professional quarterback should have, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do right now, still trying to learn this, you know, way of being a professional quarterback. So um, I don't think it's a step back, and ultimately it's going to help me in my progression. Obviously, that was perfect rookie speak right there. Say something, and it sounds like you're saying something, and then say absolutely nothing. He nailed that. Nailed it. It sounds like what his veteran teammates have been so impressed right, with. Say this, the course say this, of say camp this, yeah. When you've heard Lorenzo Alexander and these other guys talk glowingly about Josh Allen, I think it's been partially because of that. I'm interested in what you guys think on this because – we talk so much about the process of bringing rookie quarterbacks in, and the conversation always seems to be what's the right way to do it as if there is one, which I don't think there is. But in this situation with Josh Allen, it seems like a unique blend of certainly we understand he's raw, but also understanding the very lack of talent that seems to exist on this offense, particularly up front what we saw during the preseason. They're replacing I think three offensive yeah. linemen from last year, including yeah. an, you know a great center and mm-hmm. Eric Wood, who uh, ended up retiring. So, you look at this situation, do you guys see it as more about the surroundings cast or about more about Josh Allen? I, I think like most things, it's a combination of saying, hey, do we want to put a guy out there who, who we think internally going to see a lot of pressure? You know, he's going to see a lot of things coming at him quicker than we probably want him to. I think coupled with the fact of, of all the quarterbacks out there, was he the least ready? Lamar Jackson, possibly, though he played a better last game. The third game was, was a bit of a struggle. Josh Allen, while he certainly looked good and you saw that arm, he made some, some bad throws, um, and some bad decisions as they all did. But, but I think a lot of them stuck to what we thought about them. So I, I do think it is a bit of a combination, but I, I do think the fact that that quarterback is going to be under a lot of pressure could have something to do with and, it. And again, what was his biggest knock coming out of college? It was accuracy. Yeah. And you, you're going to have to be significantly more accurate in the NFL because the windows are much smaller. No one doubts the cannon of an arm he's got or the fact that he has the poise in the pocket. All that stuff is great, but if you don't make the completions, it doesn't matter. And it is kind of weird because the Buffalo Bills this past season ended the longest playoff drought in the NFL. And normally you think you're trending forward yeah. in a situation like that. Every, and look, everyone could be wrong. There's no question. But everyone sort of seems to be on the side that, yeah, this is not going to go well for the Bills in 2018. Coming up, the pendulum of justice in New York is finally swinging again. But does that mean he can hammer down the gavel? We'll get to that after this. Remember when you couldn't order a ride at the press of a button? Or get online without hearing this? Or get Domino's delivered to over 150,000 unexpected outdoor locations? Wait, what? Introducing Domino's Hotspots. You can finally get pizza delivered right to the beach, the quad, or the dog park. Not at home? Not a problem. Find a Domino's Hotspot near you and get two medium, two-topping pizzas delivered for $5.99 each. Two at a minimum handmade pan pizzas will be extra asked for this limited time offer. Prices for participation delivery area and charges may vary. Restrictions apply. Visit Domino's.com for details on Domino's Hotspots. Brought to you by Capital One. Capital One wants to build a better bank, one that feels and acts nothing like a typical bank. It's why they're reimagining banking by offering accounts with no fees or minimums and one of the best savings rates in America. You can open a Capital One account from anywhere in five minutes. That's banking reimagined. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Capital One N.A. Time for an oil change? 
Head to Jiffy Lube. We've got you covered. We've also got you covered when it comes to oil changes, thanks to Pennzoil Synthetic Motor Oil, getting you back on the road in a Jiffy. Jiffy Lube. Leave worry behind. Glad you're with us. Gold can win. Go on ESPN Radio and ESPN2 as we will be going forward. We're excited about that. The first two hours of the show now mm-hmm. from 6 to 8 Eastern are on ESPN2 as well as ESPN Radio. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. See how the days it is today? You know, it's like waffle day there are too or many days. donut day or you notice how I went to oh, food yeah. right away on this? Stacking yeah. days. So supposedly today, Tuesday, September 4th, newspaper carrier day. What? what newspaper? Yeah, newspaper, newspaper carrier, carrier, like the person, like okay. a, like a yeah. paper delivery person, like, like a paper, boy. like a kid that used to ride his yeah. bike, but now a per, an adult who throws it out the window of their car as they drive by. Uh-huh. Another look unlimited day. It's always the Tuesday after Labor Day. I've never heard of that in my what? life. That one sounds like it's used to move merch. Yep. Wildlife Day, College Colors Day, and Macadamia Nut Day. Okay. You know what the most important part of today is, though. What's what? that? It's Bay Day. Beyonce's birthday today. Is it really? Yes. Queen B turns what thirty seven today? No, oh, she is twenty nine. Always in my heart. Twenty nine. Don't you don't uh, listen, know? Don't, she tra- she don't. transcends any sort of numerical value you can attach to her okay. age. All right, she's essentially a deity, and I'd appreciate let's that just, kind of respect. Let's just all say we love her and let's move on. Yep. Don't Before, poke dive. Do, yeah. Did, well, mm-hmm. did you ever see that Saturday Night Live skit they did a few years ago when someone said? <laughs> I really don't like Beyonce. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean you don't like Beyonce? Don't do it. It's very, don't it's very, very, down, the, very do not very go good. down that road. Uh, a lot to get to this morning, and we'll get mm-hmm. to all of it, but first let's start with what's trending, and the trend continues for Roger Federer, who has not won the U.S. Open in now over a decade. He last hoisted the trophy at Flushing Meadows in, in 2008, surprising upset in four sets to Australian John Millman last night. Listen, this is the first time ever that Millman had beaten a top 10 opponent and the first time ever that Federer had lost a match at the U.S. Open to someone outside the top 50 in the world. You know, we talked about the heat that was there, especially when this tournament started where they changed the rule on the men's side for for heat breaks. It was in the 80s last night, but the humidity was like 75%. And Roger Federer flat out said it affected him. He said it absolutely affected him. He had a chance. He won the first set. He had three break points serving to win the second set. Didn't get it done. He had a chance in the third set to win the set on a, on a, on a uh, to to end the set. Didn't get it done. He just said, "Listen, I I ran out of gas." Millman did a better job of dealing with the heat, but seventy eight unforced errors, ten double faults in this one. Just didn't play well. Fatigue makes cowards yeah. of us all, and, and pointed pointed out rightfully so that Millman, based on where he's from, might have a little bit yeah. of a uh, uh, an advantage considering the elements on there. From was it Brisbane, Australia? Brisbane, Australia. Yeah. It is one of the hottest, muggiest places in the world. And the funny thing is, you're right. Federer is notorious for being as fit or more fit than anyone. He trains, uh, you know, down in, I think, in Cutter in the heat in the middle of the day, sometimes going through eight, uh, practice opponents during a week because they can't keep up with him. So very odd to see Federer at 37 now, guys. Just going to say. Yeah, the guy who, you know, could not maintain and find his composure in that heat. And you, you have to wonder if that's eventually going to be a problem going forward for him, right? And that's always the one thing we hear from all-time greats, which is, I don't want to stick around if I can't maintain the level that I'm accustomed to. And Federer started playing fewer tournaments and structuring it in such a way to kind of preserve that for himself, but eventually it always is going to force the hand, and we're waiting to see that with this crop of greats across all different sports right now. And, and again, congratulations to John Millman. You knocked down <laughs> Roger Federer, the guy with the most... Grand Slam titles in the history of the sport, and now you've got to play Joker in the next round. Yeah. So rest up, recover, and get ready for arguably the guy that's playing the best right now of anybody in the world, Novak Djokovic. Well, for the second straight week, Bryson DeChambeau, the mad scientist on the PGA Tour, walking away with the biggest check at one of the biggest tournaments. He won the second straight of the four FedEx Cup playoff events, this time taking the Dell Technologies Open up in Boston. Shot a final round 67 and is assured of being the number one seed when he gets to the Tour Championship in two weeks, regardless of what happens at the third playoff event uh, next week, or this week, coming up in Philadelphia. Setting himself up for a nice $10 million payday in this FedEx Cup. Yes. And also, maybe not about how many you win, but when you win, setting himself up for that decision today by Jim Furyk, 
we had the eight automatics on the Ryder Cup, and then there's going to be the four captain picks, of which three are picked today. Jimmy, Jimbo, Bryson Jersey. DeChambeau. I mean, you want to talk about this, this? He should be the absolute lock. So do, it, do we think it's going to be DeChambeau, Mickelson, and Woods announced today, and then that last spot of who it may go to? But we, I don't think there's any doubt we're hearing DeChambeau's name today. Yeah, riding the hot hand, because especially right now, too, it Trending has always been the word that we've associated with these last few, especially the captain's picks. And DeChambeau, I think, is 96 on the tour and fairways. Hit was ninth in the tournament yeah. this weekend. Has kind of been riding that hot hand in that, so might as well. Uh, and again, those captain's picks, 5 o'clock today by Jim Furyk on the Golf Channel. And just for keeping interest, there are 12 picks on the Ryder Cup team. The first eight are automatic. Uh, 9, 10, and 11 in the points at the time of which uh, they made the selections were Bryson DeChambeau, Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods. Yeah. So uh, I would, uh, for entertainment purposes only, except for a few states, I would say if you wanted to be entertained on this certain topic, you would be entertained with a large chunk of entertainment that the three names you will hear out of Jim Furyk's mouth today will be Bryson DeChambeau, Tiger Woods, and Phil Mickelson. We are confident that DeChambeau will remain to the U.S. Ryder Cup team today, and a confidence team is brought to you by National Mortgage Lender Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidence. And we continue with what's trending. And Aaron Judge, returning from the injury, took a big step forward on Monday when the Yankees right fielder swung a bat for the first time since breaking a bone in his right wrist in July. And guys, even though that the Yankees are well ensconced in that first playoff uh, wild card uh, standing right now, I think they're four and a half games I up on th- the A's. Three and a half now. Three and a half now. Them, yeah. uh, they're, they still have a comfortable lead, and they've, they're well over 500. You cannot overestimate the difference that Aaron Judge has made in this lineup. It's remarkable when you look at what the Yankees are with and without him in the lineup. So are we, is anybody concerned? We, we heard three weeks on this. Now there's, that there's was very optimistic, didn't but, you think? But well, there, there's the three weeks of, are you back in three weeks? Or are you just back to being able to maybe swing a bat in three weeks? Well, I mean, that seems to be the discrepancy right. here because a lot of people were saying it was supposed to be three weeks, but I remember hearing, I thought when this first happened, it was going to be three weeks before he could pick three up weeks a bat of again. recovery time yes. and then start the process. Because we know with a lot of injuries, there is that timetable where it's just rehab or just treatment or just these things. And now getting back to the point, he took 25 dry strings without hitting a ball, another 25 with a ball off the tee. Right. So he went max effort it was still wasn't quite in a live situation where he would have to adjust he would have to do some of the things that come in the normal at bat and, and this rehab when you have a chip bone is nothing but waiting yep, i mean yeah. that that's the rehab is waiting and then obviously getting used to swinging a bat what what he said at one point the pain was at a five two weeks later it was as a four so there was concern is it not healing fast enough it's all you can do with the bone it's just kind of wait and then, you know, obviously they haven't been as good with him out of the lineup as in. Well, that's, I mean, it really is amazing when you look at all the sluggers that they have in this lineup. And some of them have been nicked up along the way, whether it's Sanchez or Didi and all that kind of stuff. And you have Stanton there. So you think, okay, our lineup is protected. The numbers suggest Aaron Judge is the most important part of this entire lineup for the Yankees when it comes to offense. They are barely over 500, three games over 500 in the 42 games. 40, yeah, 41 games that he's missed, 22 and 19. They are 64 and 33, winning at almost two, th- at, at, at exactly two thirds percentage, 66.6% when he's starting. So just having him in the lineup yeah. makes a massive difference. And the guys that have replaced him in right field, whether it's Stanton, Neil Walker, Shane Robinson, and now McCutcheon, uh, their batting averages, 168, 250, 275. So I mean, literally, he is the biggest part of that lineup, even with all the other sluggers in there. Uh, when they get Aaron Judge back, hopefully they'll be able to, uh, for Yankee fans, they'll be able to win at the rate they were before he got It'll hurt. It'll be interesting if he comes back too early. I yeah. mean, it looks, you know, you start swinging that bat. You know, at any injury, when you recover, any athlete's been through it, and you start to start to feel good again, you want to accelerate it. You want to say, okay, I'm, I'm getting close. I, they, to me, that's the hardest part. When you're in a cast... And you got to wait. Nothing you can do. You know, you're you're not antsy at that point because you know you're in a brace, you're in a cast, whatever. But once you start that rehab, and once you start feeling less pain, and once you are able to kind of do what you can do in that sport, man, do you want to accelerate it? And that's when you need the other people, the training staff especially, and then the coaching staff to say, "Whoa, let's make sure on this one." 
also, though, depending on where you are in the race yep. as well on whether you want to come back a little early or not. This is a lot like the debate. I think it was last year to bring back Brett Favre late in the season. To, or Excuse me, Brett Favre. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers late right. in the season to see if he'd say, be able to say, how far back them. are we going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the no way right, you never season. know. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, the decision to bring back yeah. Aaron Rodgers, they were still technically alive in the playoff hunt, and then how quickly that changes things. So this series against the A's is an important one right. for that reason. Exactly. <laughs> Goal again, Wingo, presented by Progressive Insurance with insurance for cars, home, boat, motorcycles, RVs, and commercial vehicles at 1-800-PROGRESSIVE and Progressive.com. Okay, uh, this next story uh, is is really fascinating on a lot of levels. Uh, I did not know, by the way, this was the 30th anniversary I did of not Nike's either. Just Do It campaign. Talk about one of the most successful campaigns you've ever had. Well, that company's done pretty well for themselves. Uh, they have, but this one is going to yeah. be interesting, Mike. Yes, it is. Uh, Colin Kaepernick... Uh, the former NFL quarterback, who of course is suing the NFL for allegedly colluding to keep him out of the league, is one of the faces of the Nike campaign meant to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the brand's iconic Just Do It campaign. And there's a picture of Colin, and out there it says, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, just do it. Colin Kaepernick, the face of that, and obviously... That has set off a lot of opinions on both sides of this issue. Some of the technical things are this. Nike signed Kaepernick back in 2011. And even though he hasn't been playing football, they've kept him uh, on its endorsement roster over the years. They haven't used him, though, in the last couple of years. And this this is a campaign that's also including Odell Beckham Jr., uh, Shaquem Griffin, Lacey Baker, who was a, a, ex- a skateboarder, Serena Williams, and LeBron James. So it's it's including all of them, but obviously... The Colin Kaepernick, uh, that name is going to garner the most attention. Like, what is Nike doing? And what Nike is doing is Nike is looking to, when I even, I don't even think this is the millennial, the young crowd. This is younger. They're looking to the, to the mid to late teenager crew here, uh, to, to kind of grab them. But who are they also going to, you know, they're going to alienate people as well. This is Colin Kaepernick thing has been, I mean, one of the first, first tweets we got on this from Zach. Sacrifice everything is a joke due to Nike admitting they had him on the on the payroll all these years. A football career, yes. A lifestyle, no. And he's already said he's done kneeling, so his belief is a joke as well. No truth to any of this. I mean, Zach, you're entitled to your opinion, but that's ridiculous. I mean, just because he said if he was going to play, he wasn't going to kneel again, doesn't mean he doesn't believe in what he's doing. Correct. I mean, him him kneeling and starting what started and where it went, at some point do we think the narrative lost its way a bit? Yes. But there have been a lot of guys that, that have done a lot of things, and the league jumped in and is working with the players, albeit they want it even at a higher level. But something has come out of this. Oh, including Colin Kaepernick donating a million dollars and sending plane full of, of, of food and clothing to areas where it's needed for people. So he has sacrificed a lot, and he doesn't have a career right now, and he is suing the NFL for it. So this is going to be a real line drawer for a lot of people and for nike this absolutely for companies that want to steer clear a lot of times of of any kind of controversy they certainly have jumped into this one feet first because they're going to get many people that applaud what they do and many people that said you know what my nike symbol is gone oh yeah i mean twitter the last 24 hours has been people lighting very cheap nike shoes on fire cutting swooshes off of their socks yep. a lot of things that only seem to be happening for, I'd say, certain specific sects of what's going on. But what's interesting to me is, you're right, Colin Kaepernick is a lightning rod in yeah. this situation, however you want to look at it. So you have Nike that's looked at him and says, you know what, especially in the younger demo, we're still very successful, but we've ceded a little bit of ground. Adidas, Under Armour, a lot of these other shoe and apparel lines have made up ground on them in a way that's made them a little uncomfortable. They see Colin Kaepernick as potentially a gateway back into that group. On the other side, you have the NFL, and they they have this overlap there. Nike just re-upped. That's a 10-year deal going to 2028 with the NFL as their lead apparel, the swoosh on the jerseys. And you've got part of that audience and both businesses that think they know their clients. The NFL says, at least the ownership, the, the fact Colin's not signed, most look and say, Colin, what's the line we've heard? Might be bad for business. Might alienate some of their audience. So you've got one side connected to Nike and the NFL 
thinking he might be bad for their business, and another side, somewhat tangent, Nike, the apparel side, saying he might be exactly what we need. Yeah, and to, to your point, just so people understand, this is Gino Ficinati, uh, the, the Nike's vice president of brands for North America, saying, we believe Colin is one of the most inspirational athletes of this generation who's leveraged the power of sport to help move the world forward. He goes on to say, or just reference, that the new ad campaign is meant specifically to speak to 15 to 17-year-olds. And that's fine, but most... 15 to 17 year olds aren't going to be the ones with the capital to spend to buy the stuff they want to buy. That's coming from the 40 to 50 year olds right. who are the, who are the parents, parents of the, of the 15 to 17 year olds. And that's what makes this fascinating because as you said, most companies try to avoid something that they believe, whether it's right or wrong, right. would drag on their bottom line. And what is one of the things that's trending right now on Twitter? Nike boycott. Yeah. And now I, listen, if you've already bought the product, I don't know why cutting it up is serving anybody because yeah. all you're doing is is taking something that you actually spent money on yeah. and making it useless or look silly. If you want to do that, that's fine. Sure. But, but I think the bigger question becomes, will you buy less Nike stuff going forward? And I thought this was interesting. So Darren Ravel was the one that originally tweeted this, this out that kind of caught fire. And so Darren put up a poll. And it was 35,000 people. And it's on Darren's timeline, so take that for what you will, however his timeline is curated, etc., but it was three choices. Is Does Colin Kaepernick being the face of the Just Do It campaign make you more likely to buy Nike products, less likely to buy Nike products, or does not affect your purchasing habit? And it was in order of least to most. I think it was like 21% of people said they would be less likely to. It was like 28 or 29 said they would more than likely to. And over 50% said it wouldn't affect at all. So this is another example of, is the world of sports also smaller than we think? Is this going really towards, mm. they talk about a niche market. 15 to 17 is a small you range. It really, in really age. is. Yeah, diving in on something. But to your, but to Trey's point, it's not a group that has purchasing power now, but what do we talk <laughs> about with every league, everything? It's about creating that consumer base Correct. and young kids. I mean, the amount of kids that I meet out here, you talk about going towards a younger market. The sports center we do on Snapchat. The amount of young kids, teenage kids that I meet who recognize and say, I've seen you on sports center Snapchat. That yep. specific area, that's what Nike, I believe, is, is probably aiming to do here. Well, the one thing to, as well, Trey, is because I agree with you as far as purchasing power, but it's all about looking forward as well, and where do those 15 to 17, 18, 19, where do they have an impact? Social media, as you mentioned, Snapchat. Twitter and Instant. way more than the 40 year olds Correct. and the 50 year olds have an impact on that part. And that's where we are now in the social media world where they will be out there. These teenagers who like this, singing the praises of it, giving a, a, a good uh, analysis of this where other, but, but it's still, it's still a chance. It's still a chance they're sure. taking. It's a big chance. Listen, and is this about business as well and increasing? Yeah. I mean, come on. Let, let's, let's not get too altruistic here and think Nike is doing this. Wow. Look what they're doing. They're trying to make money as well. They're trying to grab the next group of people who will have purchasing power down the line there and can really spit out good vibe about their product on social media to help their bottom line. So let's not get too crazy that they're doing this all for the, gr the good of everything. As well, And that's why I'm very interested, because this has the potential, we already see some of it, to go the same way that a lot of the protests went, which is things get hijacked. You already saw a number of people yesterday posting the sacrifice everything thing and putting like Pat Tillman's picture underneath it and continuing to hijack his identity in a way that is gross <coughs> and uncomfortable yeah, correct. throughout yep. all of this. Yep. But the military you know, opposition is getting put right back into the forefront of this. I'm very interested in how Nike in this campaign associates and incorporates the message that was at the core of all this involved because they said Colin Kaepernick helped spin sports and society forward. How are they going to try and assure that that's what's at the core of this? Because you're right, it is still about making money, but once you've tied yourself to this, it's yep. how you go about incorporating that that I think is going to determine a lot of success or failure. And in many ways, this topic and this ad campaign is a microcosm of where we are as a country right now because I think we've lost the ability to disagree civilly. Like this, this idea, I, I understand why, by, why kneeling makes people uncomfortable. Yes. I, I understand yes. that. I absolutely do. I also understand why they are choosing to do what they're doing. And I understand that because we live in America where you have the freedom to express yourself, 
that's okay. Yeah. Uh, the thing that in I can in a peaceful, nonviolent manner. In a peaceful, manner. nonviolent way. Yeah. And people say, well, don't do it on the job. Well, that's not up to you. That's up to their employers. Well, that's the thing. You can't that's tell. Up to the, yeah. That's that, up that's, to their employers to figure. That's not up to you on that, Twitter. That's always been one of the interesting out. things yeah. about this is you telling somebody else how they should go about their business, uh, right. protesting something. The bottom line is you want this to bring about conversation. And to your point, Trey, I, I agree. Unfortunately, it becomes too confrontational yeah. and not an, and not enough conversational the, uh, in, in this situation. The ability to agree to disagree is yeah. significant. Yep. It's, what, it is. it's what made us a great country for all these years. I think we need to find a way to get back to that. And I don't know if this is going to help that or not. Yeah, I, I have no you idea. Know? I think at the very least, it's going to give us some interesting answers on who and what are pushing into this because it's butting up two very different groups with a very common middle point in Nike and what they represent to both of these and, sides. And so we know how it's a, it's a news cycle. This yeah. has been going on for a little while. How strong still is it? Yeah. You know, how strong still is it now that we're back in it again with his name and his face are going to be out there? Is it going to get as intense as it was or have a lot of people kind of moved on to the point of the uh the, the poll that you just mentioned where over 50 percent of people said eh, doesn't matter to me don't nope. care doesn't, one, not one, gonna affect me at all one thing we haven't moved on the nfl still hasn't figured out this anthem policy no they have remember not. i mean this this was the whole thing in the spring spring meeting hey we're gonna we're gonna do this and do that now they've walked it back they are working with the nfl pa in this but again game starts thursday game starts thursday yep and they don't still have a policy that everyone can 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 agree to and still a collusion lawsuit going Correct. through with Colin that involves a league where Nike is one of the principal sponsors like there's a lot of very interesting mesh points exactly and we'll see how this plays out going forward all right coming up <laughs> who had the best win of the weekend in college football and why did Nick Saban go the opposite direction we'll ask Paul it's been a long off season without football, but FanDuel has spent it getting into the best shape of their lives. That means this, FanDuel is ready for more. More ways to play, more ways to challenge your friends, and most importantly, more ways to win. FanDuel also has new options for playing daily fantasy with your friends because the only thing better than winning cash is winning your friends' cash. Right now, you can get a $20 bonus when you make your first deposit on FanDuel. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Will Kane. Age and state restrictions apply. It's time, time to join the millions of people that meet happy with Zoom video conferencing. Zoom gives you flawless video, crystal clear audio, and instant sharing across any mobile, tablet, or desktop device. But the best thing about Zoom? It just works. So ditch the distractions, join the movement, and meet happy with Zoom video conferencing. Visit zoom.us to set up your free account today. That's zoom.us. Zoom video conferencing. Technology powers your business and technology changes, but chances are you're still using video conferencing that was wow 10 years ago, but feels more like whoa today. Ditch the choppy video and crappy audio and get back to wow with Zoom. It's the easiest, most reliable video collaboration suite, and it costs about a third of what you're probably paying now. Wow, not whoa. Visit zoom.us to set up a free account today. That's zoom.us. Zoom video conferencing. Yeah, baby. Digging the tunes this morning. Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio and ESPN2. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pennzoil performance line, and you can get in touch with us at the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed at Golik and Wingo. Speaking of phone guests, we are delighted to be joined uh, now by Paul Feinbaum from the Paul Feinbaum Show, 3 to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio. Paul, good morning. What did you take of Virginia Tech absolutely going down there and steamrolling Florida State last night? Well, I was surprised, uh, but I think it, it just showed that the ACC could be a, a troubled conference outside of, of Clemson this year. I, I don't think we thought there were too many other threats, maybe Miami, but uh, I uh, I was really just shocked at the ineptitude of, of Florida State on, on all sides of the ball, and I think Willie Taggart now vying with uh, a couple of other coaches, new coaches for the, the most uh, inauspicious beginning. I, I, frankly, I think he won. Well, I was just going to say, there's that one. There's Kevin Sumlin lose, at Arizona losing to BYU, Chip Kelly at UCLA losing to Cincinnati. I would probably go to Taggart as well. Would, the, as, would that be the most disappointing loss? Yeah, and I think uh, primarily because uh, of the stage it was on, Mike, uh, the other ones were – clearly off Broadway. This was the lone game on Monday night, and I mean, we're just not used to seeing Florida State uh, get run over at home. Uh, I mean, think back a year ago, they were on that stage with Alabama, and then Francois got hurt, and I think because of that, we 
we made excuses uh, for Jimbo Fisher the rest of the way, but uh, this program uh, has taken a nosedive, and something tells me Jimbo last night at his mansion put his cowboy boots up and said, you know, I'm, I got $75 million for blowing that pop stand. <laughs> Talking to Paul <laughs> Feinbaum, host of the Paul Feinbaum Show on the SEC Network. And, uh, Paul, listen, speaking of the SEC, it had about as stellar a weekend as any conference can muster up. And, and I don't think the record was surprising to me as much as how it happened because it seems like for the first time in a while, and I'd be interested in your take on this, that quality quarterback plays seem to be behind a lot of what we saw. Yeah, Mike, uh, you cover this league a lot. That that has been the issue in recent years. And when you look at LSU probably being maybe the most surprising win in terms of domination, uh, Joe Burrow, who, of course, came from Ohio State, looked good. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to put him in the Heisman race yet. Uh, maybe if he beats Auburn in two weeks. So, and, and, and you just look around, and, uh, I mean, Alabama's quarterback situation will put on hold for a second. But but A and M looked moderately better uh, on, on Thursday night. Uh, in, in so many other games, uh, you have a vast improvement. And, and the only loss in the league was Tennessee. I mean, it, it was a really poor showing. But against uh, we think is a quality team and, and, and really a quality quarterback in Will Greer at West Virginia. But uh, I mean, e- even Vanderbilt, not to get, go to the bottom of the league, uh, played Middle Tennessee, and you go, well, that should have been a route, but Middle Tennessee has beaten Vanderbilt a couple of times in recent years. So uh, it was a big-time uh, dominating performance. Probably the most important win was Auburn uh, with Jared Stidham beating Washington. It was a pretty even game, a lot of bizarre calls on both sides from the officials to, to Chris Peterson. But uh, overall, the league, the league really looked good. Oh, absolutely did. This college football conversation with Paul. Brought to you by Goodyear. When you put in the hours, the reps, and the heart, nothing can keep you from being blimp-worthy. Goodyear, more driven. And, and Paul, as we're talking about the SEC, I, I think, you know, LSU's Ed Orgeron, you know, he was asked before the game against Miami, do you think you're better than people think you are? And he answered, yes. <laughs> and I, I think that LSU answered yes with a big statement win themselves. Yeah, and listen, I'm I'm, I'm happy for Ed. I think uh, anyone who's ever met him, uh you have to like the guy. The story is phenomenal. I think maybe that's where the overreaction has gone uh, to DEFCON 1. We, we, guys, we have, you guys do, do talk radio. You, know, you never know what you're going to get. But we had a call late in our show last night from an LSU fan who, who asked me, he said, do you think LSU can beat Alabama? I'm like, going, hold on a second, pal. Uh, have, you, have you looked at your schedule? You're going to Auburn. Uh, you're going to Florida. You have Georgia at home. You have Mississippi State. He said, yeah, but even if we lose to Alabama, do you think we can both make the college football playoff? That's how far LSU fans have gone uh, in the span of uh, two or three days. They've gone from thinking they'd go six and, uh, six, and six to, to, to running the table. Um, I would wait a little bit. The, the Auburn game is a week from Saturday. Uh, I like what I saw, but their schedule is still pretty brutal. What what a, a two out of three weekend for both Auburn and LSU. Auburn taking on Washington, LSU with Miami. Now the two of them meeting in another week. That is, whoever comes out of that one 2-0 and o, is going to be sitting in a nice position as we talk to Fine, uh, Paul Feinbaum, host obviously of the Paul Feinbaum Show. And looking at, I, I said this at the beginning of last season, Paul, and Michigan fans just came at me like crazy. I, my, my point was, oh, it's very... It's very good how Harbaugh has kind of turned that program around a bit and certainly grabbed some headlines, but how long do you accept third place in the division, no Big Ten titles, and not in the in the talk of college football playoffs as a Michigan fan? And now the way the season started off, others are starting to say that as well. What are your thoughts on Harbaugh and Michigan? Yeah, I mean, I've tried not to overreact, uh, Mike. Uh, I mean, losing to Notre Dame uh, should not be cause for firing. But uh, on the other hand, it's just the same story. I won't use the word narrative. I heard you earlier, and I don't want to get in trouble with the Gullick and Wingo uh, police. But I, I just, yeah, it's, at some point you have to ask the question, what has really changed at the University of Michigan? Uh, I, I, yeah, I think, I think Jim's a better coach than Brady Hoke uh, and a better coach than Rich Rodriguez, but the program still seems to be stuck on the side of the road, unable to get out of uh, out of the ditch. So if, if Jim Harbaugh can't do it, then, then who in the world can? So I, I, I'm not asking patience. That's not my business. Uh, and Michigan fans can do whatever they want. But this season ultimately will be determined by how Michigan plays against Michigan State, Penn State, and Ohio State. And if they have the same results that they have had, 
uh, for most, not all of Harbaugh's uh, career, uh, then I think at the end of the season, fans are going to be asking, what good is it having Jim Harbaugh as our coach? Well, yeah, Bill, Par- Bill Parcells famously said, Paul, you are what your record says you are. And at the end of the day, I, I-, I believe he's a better coach than Brady Hill, too. But the record suggests they're the identical coach. And the thing that Jim has done a remarkable job at is marketing. Let's be honest about these trips. He goes to Rome. He goes to Paris. And, you know, we get Marty Smith to follow him. And all that stuff's wonderful. Sure. But if it doesn't translate into more wins on the field, at what point, what good is it? It, it really does no good uh, because the spotlight is now on him. And, and we've had conversations in the past about Harbaugh. And I think some people say, well, you're, you're just a hater. I'm not a hater at all. I, I like the guy. I, I respect most of what he does. But the game the other night did not look like that program has, has taken too many steps forward in, in year four. Shea Patterson is a, is a pretty good quarterback. And, and by the way, he would not be the starting quarterback at all Miss for all of those who think that was a really big deal. Uh, Jordan Tamu is, is a better quarterback, and you saw that against Texas Tech. But but I think he's still an improvement over over what they've had in the past. So yeah, you have to hit the reset button. But if he if he doesn't start beating people, then I, I think his his credibility will be shattered. Paul Feinbaum with us in the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Paul, it seems like it, since the start of the year, and I don't think anything through week one changed. Alabama and Clemson, clearly the the top two teams in college football. After this first weekend, you get a look at a lot of the blue bloods, a lot of the ones we had ranked near the top. Who do you think is the third best team? I would probably go with, with Oklahoma uh, because I didn't expect them to be as good. And uh, I was uh, ch- checking in with Lane Kiffin Sunday, number one, to see if he was still alive And uh, <laughs> after the Florida Atlantic loss. And, and he was telling me that, that their talent uh, is, is just enormous. And I guess when you, you lose by 50 or 60 points, that's probably the, the operative thing to say. I, I was impressed with Ohio State, of course. And, and after that, I mean, the, the Big Ten is a little hard. Uh, you know, after, after Ohio State, I mean, Penn State, uh, I'm not going to read too much into that. I mean, these are all teams that are in contention. Georgia, there was just simply no way to know uh, against Austin T. But Georgia has a huge game Saturday at South Carolina. They're double-digit favorite, but the Carolina fans have been pointing toward that game a very, very long time. All right, Paul, we are fully immersed in college football. We look forward to many more conversations uh, uh, this uh, season, and I promise uh, our police will not get at you. Uh, we, we don't mind narrative. <laughs> we don't mind narrative. Always a pleasure, guys. Thanks, Paul. Paul Thanks, Paul. Paul. 1-800-PAUL. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't you know, on the other side of that, of getting a win that doesn't look great, you know, uh, Penn State or Michigan State. Why anybody schedules App State oh, I know, anyway. I, I don't know, know why. But, you know, you, you, you look at wins like that, even though they were close wins in, in that first game, you got the win. That's the bottom line. You get the win and you move on. Those teams are going to be, be obviously be a lot better. Yep, exactly. And especially when you look at the good that comes out of those. That's how the yep. coaches will adjust. We right. got through it. There's what we can learn from. Well, we are on the precipice of the NFL. Mm-hmm. And one of the best players in the league still hasn't shown up for work. Concerned? Should you be? State Farm, Robert here. Robert, somebody burned down my she shed. No one burned down your she shed, Cheryl. Oh, really, Victor? Because my she shed's burning up in the backyard. Your she shed was struck by lightning, Cheryl. Robert, does State Farm cover my she shed? What's a she shed? She turned our shed into her hideaway, Robert. Oh, yeah, that's covered. You hear that, Victor? I'm getting a new she or she shed. Can we stop saying she shed now? Go with the one that's here to help life go right. State Farm. Talk to an agent today. I dare anybody I like to listen to that song and not have your toe tap. Sorry, I wasn't listening. My toe was tapped. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Justin Timberlake. And you play the old yeah. man music? Old man music for Justin, Justin Timberlake? No, it wasn't for Timberlake. It was the toe tapping. It, it, you're telling me it, it never tapped? Yes. That's not dancing. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Vibing. That's it all is it is. not dancing. Vibing is better. You're welcome. Man. We can go with that. We good? Yes, we're good. Too okay. many technicalities for Golik this morning. I think Cliff is what right What would here. you call sitting in your seat tapping your toe? If um, someone said, hey, what are you doing right now? I'm vibing. I'm vibing. Definitely a technicality fine. Sports Center brought to you by eBay. eBay has everything you need to football season your way. <laughs> we have Yeti coolers, crock pots, and all the gear you need to rep your team, rep your ride or die team. Visit eBay and feel like you scored a touchdown without ever picking up a ball. Game day, it's happening on eBay. Trey, you better get your stuff together here with the DraftKings. Especially right? speaking of technological we, issues. We got our DraftKings group yeah. going. And, and Football we're, season, baby. Jake is trying to get it all squared away with everybody in the group. And everybody seems to be fine except for you, Trey. Well, you know I've had some issues with the phone. Well, I know that. But, okay, we figured that out. We got you in your text. Now you got you got to get ready It here. says enter your email. I'm putting in my email and I can't get in. 
This is like taking oh. the conversation where people... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, this is different. This is football season. Everyone loves hearing about your fantasy team. Everyone yeah. loves hearing about your technical difficulties yeah. in setting up your daily fantasy That's exactly team. exactly right. We've so, got issues. We've even honed in on a sharper, smaller version of all this. Figure it out, Wingo. I'm you working Figure on it out. Maybe, maybe during I'll the break. Figure it out. No, I'll, tell you what, I'll let you guys do this segment, and I'll well, figure it out. Bell has time to figure it out. There <laughs> you go. <laughs> nice segue. That? Woo! Le'Veon Bell, uh, still, again, the only deal he can sign is the franchise deal for uh, which is what fourteen and a half million dollars. He still hasn't signed it. And if you're ready to hit the button tray, I'll say Marquise Pouncey, the center for the Pittsburgh Steelers, was asked about the possibility of Le'Veon Bell not being there at the beginning of the season and what effect that would have. Button pusher. It's fine. We'll get whenever he gets there. We'll celebrate with him. At what point does it maybe become a distraction if he's not here? It doesn't at all. I promise you it doesn't. It seems so locked in and focused on what we got to do at hand this weekend. And if he, whenever he comes, we'll, we'll open a, um, open arms and hopefully he's in shape and ready to run the football. How much practice do you think he needs to be able to play? Last year he didn't need any. He was the best in the league. Jeremy Fowler, our ESPN Steelers reporter, said center Marquise Pouncey says Le'Veon Bell will be here for Wednesday's practice. Quote, count on it. He was so close. All he had to say was book it, and I would have really believed it. Oh, that would have been nice. Book it. Can I tell you something? I was talking to Brandel Chambly yesterday about the Ryder Cup, and I said these three names tomorrow for Jim Furyk, and he said you can book it. So our guy Brandel is in on book it as there well. There you go. I tell you, man, the Listen, sensation. And, and I completely agree with what Marquise Pouncey said as far as the effect on the team. You'd love to have the guy there, but while it's one of the best team sports out there, players prepare for this their own individual way. There is a, another guy you can't sit there and worry that Le'Veon Bell isn't there as you're watching tape preparing for the game, as you're lifting preparing for the game, as you're going through walkthrough, as you're going through practice. That can't enter your mind. He's not there, and you still have a game to play, so that can't be floating in your head that we're missing Le'Veon Bell. And these guys also know Le'Veon Bell, and they know the number one rule in locker rooms. Usually you stay out of somebody else's money. And Le'Veon Bell has had to sit here and watch all of his peers, the top players in their positions, of which Le'Veon Bell is in that class get paid all offseason, get paid in the last couple of weeks, and sit by knowing he's not going to get that in Pittsburgh. No, listen, you saw Todd Gurley reset the running back market, and he got more guaranteed money than the Steelers were willing to get Le'Veon Bell. And here's the deal. With Pouncey saying he'll be ready to go week one, that essentially means he has to show up today. Because Wednesday, as you know, Mike, is game plan day in the NFL. Yes, it is. So they are putting in their game plan for week one tomorrow. Right. So for him to be ready to go week one, he's got to get there tonight. So do we believe Le'Veon Bell is getting to Pittsburgh tonight? Well, I, listen, I, I wouldn't doubt that he would do that. I don't think he now, I don't, I don't think he's given up $14.5 million. There's no way he's sitting the season. No. I don't believe that by any chance. Does he, this was the same situation Aaron Donald was in last year. When, and Aaron Donald showed up during this week, and they didn't feel he had enough time, and he didn't play in week one. So, obviously, we're at that point with Le'Veon Bell. Does he just show up and not play in this game? Does he miss a game or two? I don't know. I don't know if he does. I mean, I wouldn't, I guess, Mike, I, I wouldn't understand if you're going to play the, the season this year and make your money, which I do believe he's going to do, I don't understand why you would end up missing the first couple of games when there's no negotiation here. It can't, and he knows that he can only play for the fourteen and a half mil. He can't get a long term deal till next year. The only thing I can think of in that is how much is your body worth to you as a running back? Because taking a few games of hits, because you know we we've heard that this could be his last year in Pittsburgh right. based on how things have gone. And if you're trying to get to the market and still max your value on the back end, you have a lot of wear on this body already. And, you and know the Steelers use are going to use the yeah, hell out true. of him. Is missing two, three, four games for him and losing out on that financial enough to say I took that many hits off my body going into my maximum earning period coming up. And, and the interesting thing for Le'Veon is that whether it's right or wrong, people are going to wonder, okay, <laughs> if you had a guy like Le'Veon on your roster and you know what he can do and you guys passed on giving him the big money, why are we going to think about giving him the big money? That, that's something that I'm sure that's burning him, but you know that's going to be a question he's asked yeah. in this offseason where he's basically said he's played his last. He's going to play his last season for the Steelers. And when you just watch Khalil Mack. A exactly. Coming up, the GOAT goes down, and week one is both in the books and on the horizon. We will delve all. Stay with us. Golik and Wingo. Remember when you couldn't order a ride at the press of a button? Or get online without hearing this? Or get Domino's delivered to over 150,000 unexpected outdoor locations? Wait, what? Introducing Domino's Hotspots. You can finally get pizza delivered right to the beach. 